This is a really short overview of the background information of what happened from the period of Reconstruction after the Civil War to Jim Crow, the establishment of Jim Crow. Well, the federal government sets up the Freedmen's Bureau, which is its, its mandate or goal is to turn the freedmen into moral workers and citizens. And this is where it gets a little confusing because the basic assumption among whites, and this is among Northern whites and Republicans actually, it's not just among Southern whites. The basic assumption is, is if black people aren't enslaved, the formerly enslaved would not know how to work and control themselves and um, live moral lives, right? And so there's this idea that they are inherently lazy without slavery. And so the Freedmen's Bureau thinks that they are there to teach the freed people how to be moral workers and citizens. The Freedmen's Bureau also sees their goal as to protect the rights of the freed men and women in a lot of ways, try to protect them against violence, and to try to make sure that they have the right, the freed men, not women, have the right to vote and run for office. And to some extent, they're able to do this, particularly in the areas where there are still Union troops. So what's going to be happening over the years of Reconstruction is that slowly but surely, the Union troops are going to be sent back home. And as that happens, state by state, they're going to, the Freedmen's Bureau is going to have less influence and less power to actually do something because they won't be able to call on the Union troops to support them. One basic assumption that is here is that freed women are to be treated as laborers. So we're, this is a time period where the expectation was the man went out of the house to work. Either he went out to farm or he went to a job. And the woman was sort of in charge of domesticity in the home, managing the household. And they weren't really seen, at least for middle class women, they weren't really seen as workers. Now this is a bit of an illusion because a lot of those women actually did have a fair amount of work to do in the household to make it function. But that was the expectation. But from the very beginning, the Freedmen's Bureau, Southern whites, and pretty much all the white people involved held the assumption that free women, free black women, were expected to be full-time workers for wages. And if they weren't doing that, they were being lazy. They were being neglectful. So even though a lot of families of freed people after the war, what they want to do is withdraw the wife from the workforce. Not that they expect her to not do anything, but they want her to work for the family at home. And that is treated very hostilely, both by Southern whites and also to some extent by the Freedmen's Bureau. There is constant white resistance to black independence and a constant amount of violence. You have a series of riots where Whites attack black sections of towns and cities. It happened in Memphis, it happened in Atlanta, it happened in a number of other places. There were lynchings. This is the period where we begin to see lynchings in large numbers. But there also was just this level of everyday violence. So there's a theory, a series of legal protections that come out during Reconstruction Era and that are important but aren't as effective as they should have been. First, of course, is the 14th Amendment. And if you remember the Dred Scott decision before the Civil War, the decision that says that African-Americans are not citizens and are not protected by the Constitution, 
14th Amendment directly corrects that. It says that all people are citizens by birth if they were born in the country, except for Indians. And that if you were naturalized in the country, the same thing, you are a citizen. And that because of that, you cannot deny them due process of law or equal protection under the laws. So basically, you have to treat them equally under the laws. In addition to that, you have the 15th Amendment, which specifically attends to the right to vote and says that all male citizens have the right to vote regardless of their race, color, or state of former servitude. Notice this does not give women the right to vote, only men the right to vote. And then there is passed in 1875 another piece of legislation that if it had been enforced could have made the following decades very different because the Civil Rights Act of 1875 says that everybody, regardless of race, color, or condition of previous servitude, i.e. having been enslaved, had the right to the same treatment in any kind of public accommodations like public transportation, theaters, and other places of recreation. What ends up happening is that these laws are undercut by the conservative U.S. Supreme Court. And what they do is they say that specifically the 14th Amendment only applies to state actions, things that are done by the state. It doesn't apply to anything that's done by a private individual or a corporation. So under the 14th Amendment, you can say, you can't do that to me because you're treating me differently because of my color if it's the state doing it, but if it's the Democratic Party, which is a private organization, that's how they thought of it at the time, says, well, we're not going to allow you to vote in the primary. Well, that's a private matter. It's not covered, according to the Supreme Court, by the 14th Amendment. And they outright declared the Civil Rights Act unconstitutional. So those are great laws and amendments, but they're pretty much made effectively useless to start with. You had what were called at the time black Republicans, even though they were actually mixed race people, both whites and black Republicans, and both white and black um, members of state governments, local governments, there is this push by Southern whites to challenge the system and quote, redeem the South from black rule. And it's different from what came before in that the KKK, when the KKK rode out in its original thing, everybody wore disguises, right? They weren't very good disguises. They didn't have the fancy hoods and stuff that the Ku Klux Klan gets later on. A lot of these guys just simply dressed in women's clothing. But still, there was an attempt to disguise themselves. What happens under redemption, it's open, it's organized, it's tied to the Democratic Party, and it involves paramilitary groups. Some cases like the Klan, but others as well. They, for example, set up a can in one place, they set up a cannon in front of the courthouse, basically saying any black voters, any African Americans who went to vote, they were going to shoot. They have people with weapons at the voting booth. There are attacks on Republican gatherings. Families were there, they were listening to political speeches and white Democrats come and just open fire. So it's, it's an overwhelming wave of violence, particularly against African Americans. Whites were occasionally attacked, but more often they were simply ostracized from white society.
once you have this push to bring power back into white hands, then there is a movement to make it legal. Okay, so we don't have to have guns at the voting booth anymore. We're going to make a series of laws. And really, Mississippi sets the pattern for this in 1890 with their new state constitution, the same one we have today, though it's had some amendments. And among other things, they legally set up ways to disenfranchise African Americans and also a lot of poor whites. So for example, they set up poll taxes. Um, if you want to go and vote as part of the process, you need to pay taxes. This is a big deal for people who don't have much money. Or literacy tests. And this would be not just proving that you can read and write, but also that you could interpret a passage of the state constitution to the liking of whoever the examiner was. So they take what was achieved by violence and use laws to establish it and make it permanent. At least permanent up to a point. And then of course the final stage of that is the Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896. There was an interracial group in New Orleans that had formed to challenge a Louisiana law that required separate accommodations for colored and white passengers on railroads. And so they asked Homer Plessy, a man who was one-eighth black, and he bought his ticket, which they let him do because he looked white. He went on to the train. He sat down in the white section. And when the conductor came through, he told them that he was black, but refused to move. And this was set up to be the legal challenge to the law. The problem is, when it makes it to the Supreme Court, the decision is that... Well, they don't phrase it like this, but basically that as long as separate accommodations are made for both races and those supposedly those accommodations should be equal, it's okay. It does not violate the 14th Amendment. And so really Plessy versus Ferguson sets up this system that's going to develop where you have white schools and black schools white train cars and black train cars. And even though the idea is supposed to be that it's equal accommodations, they are not going to be equal in any way, shape, or form. So there's a wave of what we call Jim Crow laws passed around 1900. And those laws do a bunch of things. They often segregate public facilities, everything from saying that there are colored waiting rooms and white waiting rooms at the train station to there are black and white drinking fountains, black and white parks, black and white Bibles that you were supposed to use when swearing in in court. And there were also segregated business regulations. So for example, pool halls in some towns couldn't serve both black and white customers. You had to pick. There were rules about restaurants. There were rules about all kinds of things. And one thing to keep in mind is this is not just a Southern issue. Tied to Jim Crow was the system of Jim Crow etiquette. And it was a series of social customs that were basically made to enforce black subservience. And so if a black and a white person met on the sidewalk, the black person would give way and maybe step into the street. Black people were addressed by their first name. Grown men were called boy. An unwillingness to ever give people the courtesy of titles like Mr. or Mrs. And it just, you know, two extremes like if a woman was working in a household as a cook, you know, she would be expected to use a separate toilet if there was such a thing available. She would be given a separate dish and set of silverware that was only for her use if she was going to eat her lunch there. A complicated piece about it, 
was the rules were determined locally. So they were slightly different from place to place, which if you were someone who was trying to travel and you were African American, that could make it very dangerous because you could move from one place to another place and find yourself violating the local customs without meaning to. And of course, those customs were enforced by violence, like we talked about with lynching, but also simply smaller acts of violence um, against individuals a system of frequent rapes of women and sexual violence against women and also of course economic reprisals. If you were behaving in a way that was not seen as sufficiently subservient you could lose your place as a sharecropper. You could lose your job. So it, it was a system that was enforced by both violence and economic injustice.